They need to invest regularly. It's called price cost averaging. So they say every month, every three months, I'm going to buy $100 of this every month, $100 of this. And they don't look at it. Don't look at it. If it goes way down and you sell, that's when the wealthy people take your money. If it goes down, you keep buying. If it goes up, you keep buying and you keep putting in, you keep buying and you don't touch it. And um, if you look at over any you know, 20, 30 year period, America grows. We sat down with one of the world's richest Jews and asked him if he started with zero dollars today, what would he do to get wealthy? What mistakes do people make that prevents them from making money? What's a smart approach to investing? What would you do if three people approached you in a dark alley? Who's going to win the presidency in 2024? We covered a lot with Dr. Rich Roberts, an entrepreneur and philanthropist in Lakewood, New Jersey, who sold his pharmaceutical business in 2012 for $800 million. We asked him a lot of questions. We covered a lot of ground. We had a sit down in his home. Let's get right into it. Being a Jew, awesome. Managing personal finances, not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. We are here with Dr. Richard Roberts, but he's famous because he's actually my uncle. So <laughs> that's his claim to fame. We have a podcast, Kosher Money. It has millions of views. And I think part of the reason is it's real, right? And I'm excited to sit down with you because after consuming hours and hours of your talks, your interviews, your YouTube channel, you're real. You, you say it as it is. I think so. And... I want to get straight into it. So it's a money podcast. You've had some experiences with money, good and bad. There are many people listening in their 20s and 30s. I can't tell you we have many listeners in their 70s and 80s. And people in their 20s and 30s don't want to make mistakes. They'd rather learn from people who've made the mistakes. So you get that from books and listening to podcasts like this. But when someone approaches you and says, Uncle Rich, I don't want to make money mistakes. What money mistakes do you see out there, especially when people are just starting out, getting married, and as it relates to their finances, what problems are they running into? It's a big topic, a very big topic. And I guess we could talk at another time maybe about how to become wealthy and how to stay wealthy and even what wealth is. Uh, one thing I would say is I think there's an exposure in the Orthodox Jewish community to getting defrauded by a fellow Orthodox Jew, which is very rare, thankfully, but who is a dishonest person and comes and guarantees all these kinds of returns and guarantee this and guarantee that, and people give them the, their money and, and, and just end up losing it. I am not pro-government per se. I ran a pharmaceutical company for 24 years. I battled with FDA and, and Congress and other parts of the government, but there is also a role for government. When it comes to financial matters, when you decide to start putting your money with someone who is not regulated by the government, who is not overseen by whichever branch of the government that would be, you're not taking a huge, huge risk that everything they've told you isn't true. If you know a Ponzi schemes work, that's a technique for pulling people in and getting more and more people in and then eventually collapsing. And except for the very, very early people, people lose the money. So a big mistake I see people make is by wanting to make huge returns by going with unregulated investments or individuals. And it's just a huge mistake. Another mistake I would say people make, towards the end of Yom Kippur, I gave a talk in the synagogue. It's called Ne'ila, a Ne'ila speech right before the end. And I talked about how we had this court case, which we lost. And so many of the guys came up to me when Yom Kippur was over or the next day and said, uh, Dr. Roberts, I didn't think you lost anything. So what? Uh, most things I've tried have failed. In the company, most projects we tried failed. You have to have enough dishes in the oven, enough um, um, you know, shots on, on goal or shots at the target, and that hopefully the ones that hit will be successful, and you don't put all of your eggs in any one basket. So if that shot misses, you're then financially destroyed. So that gets to really the point of diversification. Um, so if number one, failure, yes. Be prepared to fail along the way, but diversify, understand risk. And by the way, when it comes to the highest levels of finance and wealth, they live with, by risk. They understand risk. They, talk, they think about risk all the time. 
I know someone once said to me, well, I have this many dollars. Um, how much can I get off of it each year if I just you know, put in an investment and get dividends? I said, well, it depends on your level of risk. But the thing you have to know about risk is most people think risk, risk is like a number and it's not going to happen to me. But it does. It happens to some people. It depends how risky it is. It can be very, very variable. So yeah, that's why you diversify. I'm going to just keep going, sort of a little bit tangents here. But uh, 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 builders, home builders are famous for this. They build a, a, a project that's successful. They sell it and they make a lot of money. They roll all the money into one bigger project. And they, they and that's successful, and they keep rolling to bigger and bigger projects until the biggest one and that one, the last one, that's the one that fails, kind of like the Peter principle, but in in you know, rolling up your money. So you need to always keep in mind to diversify. As a matter of fact, among the super wealthy, there is the two percent rule, which is you never put more than two percent of your assets in any one investment. It's a good thing to do also as a not so wealthy person. The mistakes, yeah, don't trust people. Don't don't trust people. Period. You know, if they're not regulated by the government, understand taking a huge risk. Diversify. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. You know, your friend comes to you. He needs money for this, money for that. Especially if it's a sure thing, it's guaranteed. It always run, right. run, run. Don't walk away. Run from it. Oh, everybody knows. Run from it. So in the Orthodox Jewish community, people are are overwhelmingly honest. Honest with each other, honest with other people, honest with money, and then then and trust. And they they think that other people are going to be like they are, and then you get that occasional bad apple, and bang, they lose their money. Big mistake. Usually, when someone comes to you with a guarantee or I'm making a lot of money from this, you trust them, but the person who they trust is usually the bad apple, right? It's not always I'm going to give you all my money, but it's. I'm giving you all my money, and then he's going to go to somebody he met that's giving him money. And there's different degrees of separation where you don't really know where that money went, and then you find it often it comes back to bite you. Right. The fraud can occur anywhere along the chain, from the one you're directly interacting with to wherever the money is going after that. You're really investing, and it's not in something that is government regulated. You know, we're giving it to, through a major investment house that you know that's you know clearly government regulated and responsible then you need to make sure you have a lawyer and the lawyer is doing the due diligence to make sure if you're buying, they're buying a property and you're part of that group the property is actually getting bought and the money is actually not going from you to this guy it's going into a escrow fund at a, at a legitimate law firm to make the purchase and not and not released until the purchase is actually made uh, but this thing you know i've just seen too many people get ripped off this way so let's say an investment is government regulated, but you don't have a ton of transparency as to where the money is going. It sounds scary when there is a lack of transparency, but is it important? It's really good to invest in the public markets, stock markets, things that are monitored and you know by government regulation. By the way, it's not to say there's never been a fraud in the stock market. Clearly there has, and people go to jail and people lose money. Uh, but uh, your, your risks are much, much, much lower uh, and especially if you can make sure you diversify so you don't put any more than 2% in any one stock. Or as I tell people about, you know, in stock market to buy the S&P 500 index or the Dow index. Dow is DIA, called Diamonds. But just, you know, it's a, I don't know, a, a name for it, but DIA, which it, then you have the top whatever 50, 60 companies in the country. And your your each dollar you're investing is actually across 60 different companies. So you're actually diversifying that way or the S&P 500 across the top, top 500 companies. But when it comes to transparency, in public markets, you cannot know more than anybody else, which is the whole fallacy about picking stocks. You can't know more than anybody else. It's illegal. It's called insider trading, and the government will prosecute people for this. So you're not going to have that inside information. Uh, you know, people want to get get like an advantage. You can't have that. Can't have it. Can't have that advantage. It's illegal. Uh, and when you're buying actually the S and P 500 or the Dow DIA Dow Industrial Average, you know, index fund, not only are you diversifying across all these different stocks, all these different companies, uh, you're also really investing in the future of America. And you're investing in the, the system of American governance over other countries. So even, I mean, it's terrible the way the, the debt has been going up in this country, at frightening numbers. Since I was a kid, it was always frightening numbers. It keeps getting more frightening. Numbers keep getting bigger. Used to be a billion was unthinkable. 
Now we're talking trillions. And of course, I don't know what we're at now, 33 trillion and counting. So that, that's scary. But where else are people going to put their money from around the world? Where are they going to put their money? We are the best of the bad parties. Are we going to put it in China? China's full of just lies. They lie constantly about the, what they report. I, I don't have to go through it. Everybody, everybody really knows building all these cities with nobody in it and, and the banks are collapsing. I got it. Russia. We're going to put the money that you know that government is not going to grab it one day or corruption is not going to, you know, you're really investing in this American system of government and ownership and non-corruption. Not to say there's no corruption here, but they get arrested or the government is after them to arrest them. So that's what you're, you're investing in. But when you go then to all these private investments, uh, you know, somebody says he's doing uh, what's it called? Hard money loans. You don't know what is actually happening with your money. And if you gave X, Y, and Z guys, these, these 10 other guys all said, oh, they kept getting their 15% every month. Well, that's, that smells like a Ponzi scheme. He'll keep doing that and getting more and more money from people until all of a sudden there's no money there and he ran off with it. You and many of our guests have mentioned index funds. Have you personally learned the hard way as it relates to stock picking? Sometimes people think they're smarter than you know the machines nowadays and, and, and the professionals back in the day. Um, did you learn that the hard way? Or once you got involved in the investing component of your life, you knew index funds are potentially the way to go? Not only did I learn it the hard way, I didn't take my own lesson to some degree. And that just ended up with worse returns also. It's well known, and it's been known for the last 40 years, that anybody who picks stocks, any mutual fund, uh, 90% of them do not beat the average. They do not beat the index fund for the S&P 500 or the, or, the, or the Dow. They don't beat it, 90% of them. And the next year, the 10% that do beat it are not the same as the one for the year before. They can't predict it. They can't know. During COVID, when... Um, COVID first hit and the market uh, crashed 40%. I, I have one of my videos on my YouTube channel. I told people, now's the time to buy the S&P 500 or the Dow, you know, index funds. I said, because if America goes out of business, your money has no value anyway. And America is the most, is the one's going to come out of it first. America is going to be the strongest. I don't know if it's going to be six months or a year or 10 years, but that's where you want your money to be. So many people come up to me I like it like a two years later and tell me how they doubled their money and thanked me for it. And I'm happy that it helped them. I don't I don't want anything for it. I'm happy that it helped them. And now I have a lot of my money invested by Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. And they do give us additional diversification because we can go into private equity funds, which are again less regulated, but uh, regulated by the financial industry and and um, by the big people in the financial industry. And even those that were, were diversified across those, you can't get access to them on your own. They have minimums, which I don't think I even want to say what the minimums are, but they're not what- Over $100. Yeah, they, uh, a little north of that, you might yeah, say, right? Yeah. And then it's a little hard to, to actually judge my returns right now because the way private equity funds work is they're going to raise, let's say, $5 billion from a lot of people investing the money through the investment banks that, that are managing the money. And then- they don't actually raise the $5 billion. They get commitments for $5 billion. They start buying companies, doing all their work, all these smart people, doing due diligence on different companies, different ways of trying to make money on that. And they'll start investing the money. And as they need money, they'll tell you, well, you owe $30,000. And the other, and they, everybody's going to get, is going to contribute their piece. I don't know who the other people are, all the people that are, that are committed to it. And so that's called a, a capital call. They'll call your, the cash they need every step along the way. And after about three years or four years, the companies that they invested in previously start returning money. And before you know it, the next few years of investing, you don't have to actually put any money in because the other companies previously returning money and that's putting money in. But then what happens is if I look at our total portfolio, it'll skew the results downward because the initial three years that money's being put in and nothing's coming out. But all in all, I would have done better financially in terms of just flat out results, but would have put it in DIA or SPY. Right. Well, SPY okay. is the uh, S&P 500 index fund. Is there a WhatsApp group where the ultra wealthy converse about this, right? 
Or is this you in your office, you know, moving <laughs> a mouse, maybe making a call to your accountant advisor? How are you discovering what to do? I mean, index funds are, are relatively easy once you get the point of it, but almost like a social circle where you can converse with others that are thinking or have invested in these uh, larger companies and firms? I don't know if there are such groups. Um, I would not want to be part of it. When someone is a high net worth individual, then the investment banks that they choose, um, such as Goldman or JP Morgan, but there's all the major banks have them, and many, many more, have wealth management groups. They'll dedicate several people to you, your account, uh, your investments. They won't be doing the actual investing. They will be tracking everything for you, asking if you want to go for this investment or that investment. Do you want to go into this private equity group or not? This is how much they recommend. This, and they give you all, all the filings from that group on their, their history and what their objectives are. So the, it's a, the private wealth management groups that are interacting with the well-to-do people. Now, there are also home offices, which I don't have. You know, people have home offices. They want to spend their time trying to make more money. Personally, I'm not really interested in, in doing that anymore. I work like a maniac for 37 years morning, noon, and night in all facets of, and it just uh, tormented and beaten to, beaten to a pulp. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, I actually happened to get back, it's a little complicated, but I got backed into having to run a certain real estate investment now. But I had mostly lawyers doing it and the engineers and, and my involvement is minimal. Uh, but I decided at some point that I really I just don't want to be actively involved. And that's why I just let these groups do it. But if someone does decide to invest money in the index funds, which is a very smart thing to do. Again, there's a th thousands of index funds, and some concentrate on banking, technology, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about the, the DIA and SPY, which is the Dow Industrials and, and the S&P 500. So you're across the top 60 of the top you know, 500 companies in the United States. I say Dow is 60, whatever the number is, mm -hmm. something like that. If people follow that advice, what they need to do is they need to invest regularly. It's called price cost averaging. So they say every month, every three months, I'm going to buy $100 of this every month, $100 of this. And they don't look at it. Don't look at it. If it goes way down and you sell, that's when the wealthy people take your money. If it goes down, you keep buying. If it goes up, you keep buying and you keep putting in, you keep buying and you don't touch it. And um, if you look at over any you know, 20, 30 year period, America grows. And you automate, right? <laughs> you, you don't have to manually do that week in, week out. If you automate it, set it and forget it. I think it can be. I don't, I don't know how, because I, um, I don't actually do that myself because right. I'm, I invest differently now, but um, I would think you could. And by the way, and you open up your own account. I have a Charles Schwab account, but there's, you know, I don't know, America, Amerisource E-Trade, uh, Ameritrade, whatever they call it. Fidelity, Vanguard, all the major banks have online. But you know you should be paying nothing or almost nothing for your trades, and you should not be trading in and out. This is how you make money. You buy it and you invest long term. There's other keys to making money, by the way. We'll be right back to this week's episode, but first, a message from Twillery. If you're listening to this, within the first few days of this episode drop, so we're dropping about March 26th, you have until March 29th to take advantage of an offer that they've never released before. This is for returning customers. So before Pesach, Passover's coming, and this is a very large discount for Twillery. New customers, previous customers, you can stock up on polos, button downs, blazers, pants, their new ear suits, all before Passover. You have until Friday, March 29th. If it's after 29th, stay with me. You can take advantage of get this two different deals, okay? So you have Pesach 18. We're going to put the codes in the show notes. You get $18 off of $250 or more, or if you want to double that and give it to the next person. No, you can do code Pesach 36, $36 off $350 or more on your purchase. So even if you've taken advantage of our promo code CHAI, C-H-A-I, which is $18 off your purchase of $139 for new customers, and you're sitting there listening to this episode in your polo shirt, your suit, your blazer, whatever you're sitting there, it's Twillery decked. You can now take advantage of $18 off or $36 off. So Pesach, P-E-S-A-C-H, 1-8, 
or P-E-S-A-C-H 36th. Take advantage. If it's after March 29th, 2024, where most of you will be listening, that's okay. Use promo code C-H-A-I, assuming it's still running. First-time customers, they have the most comfortable shirts, jackets, blazers. Stop wearing clothing from 300 years ago. Level up. Twillery.com slash kosher money. Use the promo codes, polos, button downs, blazers, pants, whatever they are. It's comfortable. I'm a big fan. Can you tell? Now back to this week's episode. So I want to get into that, right? Imagine you didn't go through 37 years of <laughs> tormentation. You were a 25 year old guy, <laughs> just got married, no kids, one kid. You're single. You're 25 years old. And your parents turn to you and they say, make something of yourself. You know, you got to <laughs> provide for a family. What would you do? What would Rich Roberts, who at that point doesn't have the medical acronyms, you know, after his name, what would you do looking out at the world in 2024 to start building wealth? Uh, there are different options. I mean, going to college is um, is debated now as to the value of it, because college can be very, very expensive and put people under a lot of debt. And how much more they're going to make is questionable. Having a degree in finance is really, I think, very valuable because you know I used to think that the only smart people were in science and medicine. And when we went for, and our company went for a, a $250 million recap on, on Wall Street, um, I was shocked by, and I was the president and CEO of the company at the time, I was shocked by how smart these people on the other side of the table were. And there'd be whole groups of them um, asking me questions about the business they knew exactly what to ask, penetrating questions. They understood what I was telling them and came back with questions from what they processed from my answers. Um, I was very, very impressed with them. And they can, get, they can make a lot of money in finance. Now, not everybody is that smart. And not everybody gets up to that level. But there is a lot of opportunity in finance. Starting your own business is really, you know, very few people are going, are going to make a lot of money with their own two hands. Now, you could be a professional sports player, right? If you make it to the NFL or the NBA and you're a star, but you can make a gazillion dollars. The other part about getting wealthy, I'll talk about it because they also lose it. They can inherit money, some people, but they don't know the other part that I haven't told you about yet. They, they, they'll just lose it. Good chance they'll just lose it. And in starting your own business, I've, again, given no interest loans to several people who want to start their own business. And what became clear is if they lost all the money, they're clueless. They have no idea how to run a business. They don't even know the basics of profit and loss. I'm selling these items. Uh, um, you know, I'm buying it for uh, $100. I'm selling for 130 so I'm making money. They don't even think about, well, what does rent cost? What does electricity cost? What does gas cost? What does insurance cost? What do employees cost? The very basics, let alone other things such as inventory control, ordering, um, it just we can go on and on and on, managing people, all the laws that are involved. It just it goes on and on and on. But so I would tell people is to get a job in a business. Um, it might be real estate if that's what you like and learn, learn, work for several years and learn the business. There are very few people who just start out on their own, not having learned anything, not having worked for anybody else and are really capable enough to go out and actually do it. College doesn't teach you entrepreneurship, right? Right. Entrepreneurship is, well, it goes, it gets down to motivation because also people think that if I only own my own business, I could be wealthy. I get ready to be besieged, have problems, have issues, have stress, morning, noon, and night. It's a pizza store. The cheese truck didn't deliver. What am I going to do? Uh, this guy's stealing money from the cash register. What am I going to do? This guy is working very, very slowly. What am I going to do? I don't know if I can replace someone. It's hard to get people. This guy wants a raise. What am I going to do? Uh, these pizzas are all of a sudden coming out of the oven. They're, they're not good. I don't know why. Do I have to get the oven fixed? Is it the technique? Is it the temperature? I'm, I'm making up. I don't know the pizza business. But And it goes... It goes on and, and the customers complain and they want their money back. And then somebody, you know, says they choked on your, your slice of pizza or in the French fry and they want to sue you. It, it doesn't stop. Jews love opening restaurants, by the way. I know, yeah. Right? Like there's something <laughs> alluring about it, but not many restaurants succeed long term. Very, very few. What about tech? I <clears throat> see 
ChatGPT is in its infancy, right? It reminds me of where the internet was in the 90s. Do you see tech for an Orthodox Jew, uh, people that aren't Jewish, do you see that as a realistic way for people to provide for their family and then have some additional wealth? We're talking about AI, ChatGPT. Yeah, yeah. It's actually, maybe you're not, maybe you're showing your age. It became GPT-4. ChatGPT was original. They made ChatGPT like 3.1. Now it's GPT-4 and GPT-5 is coming, yes. which by the way, I subscribe to. It's fantastic. But in its infancy, it's probably in its infancy compared to where it can go, but it's hardly in its infancy. You have mega corporations with thousands of highly technical people developing these things already at a lightning pace, as we know, right? They say the things, the advances they thought would happen in 10 years happened in three months. And it's just, it's just leapfrogging all expectations. So you're not gonna start your own AI now. Don't be, don't be foolish, that's not gonna happen. Uh, you can get a job, that means you're getting a job at Microsoft or at Google, or, but of course you're gonna need to know programming, and that's all I know about. I don't know how to program, so I can't tell you programming languages or what you need to, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. But building tools using this technology is everywhere right now. Yes. You know, similar to people who created mobile apps like Uber when the app store started to become a thing, there's, there's an <clears throat> infrastructure now in which people who see things from a different angle could potentially create legitimate companies out of those tools, right? I run an AI tips and tricks group and the amount of tools that are coming out for every one that's quality, there's another 15 that don't do what they say they do, but there are some legitimate companies allowing other businesses to save money on sorting through documents, you know, reading through things. How are you using AI in your personal or financial? Uh, I, I only use AI for, for information I want to look up. Instead of doing a, a search online and ending up with you know, 500 links to websites and start clicking clicking on them and finding out doesn't really answer it. It's, I mean, GPT-4 is incredible. It, it just, it synthesizes all the information, puts it together. You keep in mind there could be a mistake in it and it does, they call it lying, you know, but those cases where it-, it uh, Hallucinates. Halluc hallucinates, right, hallucinates. Yeah. It, uh, some guy, some lawyer uh, made a filing in court that, that was done by, by uh, GPT, I don't know which version, and the legal references were just made up. They didn't exist. And he got into a lot of trouble for that. But with that in mind, I use it all the time. I mean, for things around the household, um, issues I'm working on. I have my, own, like I said, my own YouTube channel. I look up things that way, get the information. Sometimes it's, it will not give it to you because I think they're, they're, they're blocking it, mm -hmm. but um, it's really a, a great tool. So in terms of you know, like when people could make apps and make a lot of money on them. You would think there were going to be novel ways to use AI to in order in, to, in order in order to make apps or applic you know applications. The question becomes: It's a big world out there, and a lot of people are jumping all over this, as well as the major tech firms who have thousands thousands of people dedicated to this, and they're spending make up the number I don't know hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars on it. Well, I think like like Uber, right? Like why didn't I think of that? Right. <laughs> so if I could have thought of that first, that would be fantastic. But now people try to think up like an Uber idea where there's like Airbnb, but they're trying to do it for other things. Everybody is all over it already. So you can hope to be that next Steve Jobs or you know, Bill Gates who's who's in his garage and he's brilliant. But you better be brilliant. And you better be willing to work morning, noon, and night. And you better be creative. And you maybe better be ready for failure and for long periods of no income. So if you can do it, great. At this point, I think it's kind of like being a sports star. It does happen, but it's rare and it's not likely to happen for most people. Would you say more important mm -hmm. than the idea as an entrepreneur is your passion and drive to take a good idea and make it successful versus finding some needle in the haystack, great idea? Well, the issue becomes competition also. If what you're doing is not patentable, that you can't carve out the landscape for yourself, then if you have it, it starts to become successful, 
everyone's going everyone, yeah, quote unquote, everyone's going to jump on it and start making their competing versions. And if you think that, well, I get a patent on it, I'll be able to sue them. Okay, well, now you, you, do you have hundreds of thousands of dollars to hire the law firms to go out and start suing everybody? In the meantime, unless you get an injunction against them, they're taking all your revenue away. It, it's a very, very difficult proposition. It can be done, but it's not likely to be successful. And by the way, when it comes to AI, AI is not the stumbling block anymore so much. It's robotics. AI is capable of telling robots to do stuff. We don't have robots that are able to do so many things yet reliably, capably. But yeah, you know, I hate to threaten the jobs of anybody, but eventually you have an AI robot who's who's going to be the cleaning, not person, thing, you know, cleaning machine in your home. It will also cook the food and get the stuff out of the refrigerator for you and organize the refrigerator and then it'll be there all the time. But uh, robotics are way, way behind. So now when you're talking about AI, you're really talking about trying to apply it to, like you said, make business better in some way. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work being done by AI to make uh, synthetic uh, videos. The uh, the most recent one from, um, uh, who's it from? Is it, uh, is it from Dynamics? Google, I think. No, I'm not, not, not about robots, it's about AI. Oh. I think um, to make like videos, it comes from, I think it's from- is um, it Sora? Sora, yes. Yeah. Is that from uh, Google? It's open AI. Is that open AI? I okay. So. so, I mean, that makes one minute, videos from a written description that are astounding, astounding. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to think <laughs> that the work that we're doing with the technology that we have right now is going to be completely different than what kids who are 10 years old, when they get into their careers at the age of 25, it's an entirely different landscape that we can't even imagine, right? These robots, they'll be fighting wars where you're not sending humans to wars. You have an entire which they already, fleet. Which they're already doing to some degree. I mean, drone warfare is massive now. And drone warfare is not just, you know, firing down missiles or dropping bombs. It's also intelligence gathering. It's jamming other radars, um, many, many things that, that it does. So yeah, right, war is becoming more and more computerized, mechanized, and you know the winners would be the better economies that innovate, um, and America will also have that advantage if we can stop the Chinese from stealing everything. Yeah, the Chinese are not a sponsor on our podcast. So <laughs> you're, you're good. A quick break from this week's episode. I want to tell you about something cool, okay? You all know about the Donors Fund. If not, I've spoken about it on previous episodes. I'm throwing the script away. I want to tell you about this. In my tefillin bag, my Talis bag, I have $1 checks, $2 checks, and they come pre-printed. It is so cool. No longer do I give out cash. I give out these checks in shul. If someone comes in, they get a check. And at the end of the year, that is a tax deduction. Anyone who was giving away money on Purim had to give away cash dollars and they weren't getting any tax deduction from that. So if you went to the bank and you thought it was cool filling out, oh, I want 10 ones, 35s, 40 20s, you're giving away money, but you're not giving it through your unique checkbook. It's kind of cool. It comes in the mail. There is so much the donors fund does. So I that's just one piece. They have a lot. They have a mobile app. You can allocate money um, put money in, you get an instant tax deduction, and then you can start giving the money away as you please. I don't want to give too much away, but the app is sleek. There's a website. You can invest money. They have a lot going for them. And the best part is it's free. So I love when someone sends me a message. Hey, what's your unique link? I'm like, I got you. The donorsfund.org slash kosher money. Click the link. The link is in the show notes. Fill it out. It is free. They have a massive customer satisfaction rate that is through the roof and for good reason. They care, okay? So fill it out. Get your free checkbooks. You can search up charities there. You can give without the checks. You can just instantly send the money out. You could put the money in there and then decide months later where you want to allocate it to and get the instant tax deduction. I love it because I'm speaking from my heart, right? Not everything has to be a script, and that's what we do here on Kosher Money. So the donorsfund.org slash kosher money. Link in the show notes. And now back to this week's episode. I want to pivot back to you. Um, obviously, you've had tremendous success in your career. So I have a, a few parts to this question. And we'll, we'll start with um, the struggles, right? Let's say someone's taken your advice. They've invested well. 
They've built slowly a good nest egg. They're growing, they're diversified, they're not making the mistakes. And now they see wealth is on the horizon. It's, it's near. Charity giving aside and the struggles that come along with people wanting to you know, reach into your pocket and, and take money, what struggles do wealthy people have that aren't really spoken about, right? It's not, yeah. it's not glamorous, <clears throat> so it's not discussed, <clears throat> but it's not always as picture perfect as the magazines make it out to be. I want to answer that, but I first want to address some of like the assumptions in your question. Okay. What is wealth? People who are not wealthy don't understand this. There's a $1 million millionaire, there's a $5 million millionaire, $10 million, make up numbers, $50 million millionaire, $100 million, $500 million millionaire, billionaire, $100 billion billionaire. Those are very different levels of wealth. If someone has a million dollars in the bank or in their portfolio, their, their index fund, they have to keep working. They can't stop working. If they put that all into cash and right now in a money market and they got 5% interest on it, uh, that happens now. Uh, they have to pay, uh, I think, capital gains on that. I'm not sure if it's income or capital gains. So they're going to come out with $30,000 a year, $40,000 a year on their million dollars. They're not financially secure, so to say. They still have to work. Someone has $5 million in the bank, then uh, as long as they don't do anything reckless or, ir or irresponsible with the money, they're pretty much financially secure for the rest of their lives. Um, if someone has $10 million in the bank, then they're starting to also have financial security for their children. If someone has 50 or $100 million in the bank, they can be building buildings if they wanted a million dollars a pop or you know, for organizations, or if they have expensive tastes, they can have multiple homes and yachts, of which I have one home and no yachts. And I could have, you know, can I, I could have hundreds of homes. I, what, what do I need it for? I don't need it. And then, you know, Elon Musk spent uh, these approximate numbers, I don't know the exact numbers, spent $45 billion buying Twitter. It's now valued at, valued at about $20 billion, And he doesn't care because he already get, he's in the $200 billion range. And I just want to get back to the other thing about like owning your own business. The guy who started NVIDIA is now worth $207 billion. And he's been interviewed and he said he's not sure if he had to do it over that he would do it again. Mm. Because the toll that it took on him what I described in running your own little small business, the toll that it takes on you, and as it gets bigger and more complex, more complex, the taxing that occurs on your mental status is horrendous. The stress has long-term negative effects. And, I, and when he said that, I understood exactly what he was saying. I understood exactly what he was saying. So first of all, when it comes to wealth, there are different levels of wealth. And the other point I want to make is one of the most important parts of becoming wealthy and staying wealthy is your sense of self. The reason why I say that because of the following. First of all, almost nobody knows how much money anybody else has. I've heard wild rumors over the last few decades as how much money I have. At times when my money wasn't changing, according to the rumors, it was going up and up and up. You know, there's, oh, that's great. You know, I wish I actually got that much. Another rumor recently, someone told me, family member, somebody says, there's rumors that you have this amount of money. I said, well, that's correct in one of our accounts. You know, so people don't know. And one of the most important parts about becoming wealthy, and I learned this from a book called The Millionaire Next Door. It was written, I don't know, 40 years ago by a couple of MBAs who studied well, most wealthy people. And when they went to interview a focus group of wealthy people, they had a fancy food there, you know, pate and duck, and they had fancy look liqueurs there. And most of the guys just wanted to eat a sandwich and, and a bottle of beer. And what they came to find was, by the way, most books, unless you're talking about a textbook with, 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 which in science or medicine, most books are a waste of time. They have one or two points in them, and they spend 500 pages telling you. It's ridiculous. But I'm not saying about that book in particular, but this is the point from that book. They found that most millionaires had um, secondhand cars. They only wore $150 suits, which now today might be $300 suits. And, and they didn't spend money like crazy. And one of the key points I want to make, and I'm going to get to the point about how this the ego and the sense of self is critical, is there are many people who people in the community think are wealthy. They have fancy cars, they have multiple homes. And what they don't know is those cars are all 
all leased. Those homes have mortgages up to the hilt, and they're living paycheck to paycheck just to finance it all. And the question becomes, why do they have to do that? Why do they have to have multiple homes and drive you know, $300,000 cars when they're on the verge of, of financial ruin if one thing goes wrong? And it's because they feel inadequate within themselves. They feel they need to get the adulation of other people. Oh, they're going to think so. Hi, look at me. I'm driving my Bentley. Hi. Well, first of all, making people jealous doesn't make them love you, makes them despise you. Secondly, and, and by the way, and, and then you can see these types of people, when they're in a, in a group of people, they'll be the ones that will speak the loudest. They'll, you know, they'll speak over everybody because they're wealthy and like they're entitled. When I see these things, whether they're driving this super expensive car or they're spending money like it's going, like it's going out of style, I actually feel embarrassed for them because they're making a psychiatric admission publicly that they feel unfulfilled inside. They feel inadequate. They feel incomplete. They feel dependent on the admiration of others. You want to have a nice car? Fine, have it. You don't need 20 Jaguars or whatever it would be. You don't need them. You're doing that because you want to show off. You want to have a nice home? Fine. But you don't have to have one that's a block long and, you know, oh, well, uh, I'm going to use it for parlor meetings, okay? <laughs> All right. uh, so one of the most important parts of becoming wealthy, there's offense and defense. See, a lot of professional sports players, people who win the lottery, they had great offense, made a lot of money. Why did they end up broke? Because they had lousy defense. They spent it like crazy. And that was the mistake. You first need to get the number of millions of dollars in the bank or in index funds or whatever it's going to be, or land that you actually own, not mortgaged, that's producing income. You have to get whatever that number of millions of dollars is that you think is, is the wealth level you want to get to before you start spending freely like that. Otherwise, it's crazy. And for those people who are looking at the ones who look like they're wealthy and they're showing off and they're the loud one at the party and they're speaking over everybody else. And uh, by the way, fraudsters are famous for giving a lot of charity. They stand up, they give big charity contributions. Oh boy, he's making a lot of money. I'm going to invest with him. He's just taking people's money and he's just, that's more of the Ponzi scheme. People hopefully know what Ponzi schemes are. The people that come, become wealthy, yeah, there are the superstars. There are the guys who start Microsoft, who start Apple, who start uh, you know, NVIDIA, who, who start um, Intel. And there are lots of others like that. And then they can be big spenders because now they're worth you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. But the vast majority of people, they're really wealthy. Number one, if they're psychiatrically healthy, they don't need to show it off. They don't need a wall of gold with diamonds on it in their house to show everybody. They can have it and do wisely with it. And they know how to preserve wealth. And that, that's really critical. And don't be jealous of people who you see out there who you think have X, Y, and Z. You don't really know what they really own. A little off topic, when I, when I spoke about levels of wealth, there is a concept of working for your children or working for your grandchildren. When I, I listened to a, a sports broadcast by a guy, John Middlecoff, I think his name is, he made a very great thing. He said, do you know these wealthy people, everything is free? In other words, the concept is when you're $1 million millionaire, you still have to watch where you spend and what the prices are. If you're a $100 million millionaire, you want to buy a car, you really don't need to bar try to bargain down to save another $2,000. You don't need to really watch the price of the grocery store. Everything is like for free in a sense, because if you buy the car and you buy the groceries, you still got $100 million. It doesn't it's just noise on the screen. Similarly, when someone has, let's say, make up a $100 million number, it could be $500 million, it could be $50 million. Now, if they're still working to make money, they're no longer working for themselves. Assuming that they're not some crazy spender who you know, keeps buying you know, yachts for $100 million, but they now have enough money for them and their children for the rest of their lives. So now they may be working for their grandchildren if they're still making money. Mm. And now the question becomes, why are they even still working like that? Some of them will work much less, some stop working, but I've seen in the billionaire class, I know a number of billionaires, a lot of them have a love of money. They love the money. They just want more and more money. You know, the, the Gamora that whatever someone has, they want double. Uh, I know that the tour is completely true, so there has to be some caveat to that. Because me, I don't really want more. 
You didn't crave a billion dollars when you made your hundreds I, of millions. I didn't. I didn't say I made. Uh, that's a nice try. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't say how much I made. No, but the uh, I did the math. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> eight hundred and the thirty percent. But regardless, when you made Oops, millions, did I say that? No, I okay. saw it online. But when you made millions, let's call it. Did you crave billions? Like that's a natural human instinct. I craved. Um, financial security for my family, mm -hmm. and I craved being able to give Ted Duck a charitable work. That's what I. That's what I crave. But but most of all, I was committed. I was working desperately to make the company successful. We had two investors who, when we were on the verge of bankruptcy, they took a chance on me when nobody else would. They they invested in total fifteen million dollars each, fifteen point five million each. But it was twenty three million first. Uh, we went through the burned through 19 million to give me more. So it was a long story, but I felt I owed it to them. And we had about 800 employees between regular employees and the contract sales force eventually, which was about 200. I felt I felt an intense responsibility for them, and they all got stock options in the com in the company. When the company was sold, they all did well, which pleased me like I can't tell you. I loved my employees. I still do. I don't talk to them, but I, I still had this love for them. And I, I really, I felt the weight of their financial security on my, on my head also. That's what drove me. It wasn't really to become X number per Got se. It. When someone does make money and so much of their life was building up a business, what does the day or week or month after look like when you wake up? In psychiatry, they taught a first year medical school in, a, in, a psych, in a psychiatry. They said the day after the CEO sells a company, he's in depression, mm. real depression, real clinical depression. Is that depression. the day where the money is still in limbo? It has to move from one account to no, the other? No, it's gone from his business into, it's into, into cash. Wow. He has the money. Senator Arlen Specter, who I knew, he's now passed away. He was one of the most powerful people in the country. Everyone wanted to talk to him. Everyone bowed to him. Everyone invited him. As soon as he left the Senate, nobody knew him anymore. I have a sister. She was chairman of OBGYN in a, in a hospital. She said, all the doc doctors there, they, they want to invite her to her, their parties. They want to go out to dinner with her. They, they're, they're all you know praising her. As soon as she retired, she never heard from them again. Mm. So when I was working in the company and trying to get it up, to the point of being able to, to, to eventually be successful and sell for everyone's benefit. I was telling people, um, I said, I do not have my identity tied to being the president and CEO of this company. My identity is, am I allowed to talk? Well, it's kosher money. I sure. can talk Jewish, right? Everything. We translate on the bottom, so okay, fine. feel free. No, my, my identity is as a Jew. My identity is as someone who who believes in God and wants to be a servant of God. We would call it an Eved Hashem. I'm a husband. I'm a father. Now, thank God I'm a grandfather. Um, I help the community in so many ways, even with medical advice, believe it or not. I always give the caveats that, I'm, no, I'm not practicing medicine, but then I analyze. I mean, I've had a number of saves, uh, you know, which I was thrilled to be able to do. But my identity was not tied up as the presidency of the company. But most presidents and CEOs, it is. It's their ego. They're always, and, and I've seen this in these organizations that are very hierarchical. And they just, you know, the bigger the organization, the more they just bow to the king. I joined some charitable group that the president of one of the largest pharmaceutical companies was the, the head of their, their group, this charitable group. They sent around health clinics on wheels into impoverished areas. And I went to only one meeting and I asked questions and they were horrified because this guy here, I remember he was president of Bristol Myers Squibb. The mm -hmm. other people, one guy had been like a VP at American Express, horrified that I would ask real questions. Like some guy got up and says, well, my job is I interface between this and this. It's an interface. So what do you actually do? <laughs> right? Horrified. And that's these. That's part of the reason why many of these big organizations become extremely inefficient. Mm. Not as inefficient as government, but very inefficient. Um, and then they eventually they suffer for it because people so, are tiptoeing around the <laughs> the wealthy and the high to do, bowing up the hierarchy. And and there's it's a, like in the pharmaceutical industry. There's a big um, the brand of pharmaceutical industry, big 
uh, sort of fix that's in. You're always loyal to the guy above you. And then if he ends up getting downsized and goes somewhere else, and you all get downsized, he goes somewhere else, he'll bring you along. So the, you play the, the, the bow to the hierarchy game. Matter of fact, I had a, a, a vice president of sales and marketing who came again from one of the largest drug companies in the country to us. I said, like, why is it that people just in those companies don't care? He says, Rich, it's not that they don't care. They came into the companies wanting to do great things for the company, coming up with new ideas, wanting to innovate. And they would send the ideas up the, up the management chain and they would never hear anything back. They just died. And eventually they realized, you know what? Just do your job, be loyal, get your, get your pay, get your, you know, whatever bonus you'll get and just play along and then stop even caring so much. So this all comes down to the guy at the top, if his identity, if his meaning in life, if his, if his ego is the type that needs this constant adulation from people, and once he sells the company, once he's out as CEO, he no longer has that and it goes away. It's a very, very common thing in, in psychiatry that those people are depressed. Mm. Real, real true clinical depression. Do you find for you that people are fake sometimes around you because of who you are and the success you've had? In 2007, when I gave my first large charity checks, Sadaka checks, and, um, I guess that I means charity. I don't, I don't, need, to, I got you, I don't right. need to translate for you your take Some of our Yiddish guests we've had. A uh, right, yeah. <laughs> All good. Our lives were ripped apart. Our lives were ripped apart. Now, I gave, I don't know, two or three checks of a million dollars each to a few organizations. And when I tell this to my FFB, my religious from birth friends, I said, when, when we would land as a company, Rite Aid or Walgreen or CVS for a product, we wouldn't tell anybody that we're selling the product to them now because we don't want anybody else to try to move in on the business. So I assumed that when I gave these checks, they wouldn't tell anybody else because they, they want to make sure that I have more money in the future to give to them. That's not what happens. They tell everybody. Mm. Um, it's like, I'm, I'm just a dumb Balchu Balchuva. I, I had no idea. And then our lives were torn apart. We had um, two or three telephone lines at the time, uh, back before cell phones were popular. Um, you couldn't get on the phone. You couldn't get on the line. The lines rang morning, noon, and night. People were banging on our door morning, noon, and night. Virtually every friend, relative, neighbor, um, even one doctor and one uh, lawyer all contacted us that their the head of their school that their kids go to want to meet with me. You have to understand, I was working morning, noon, and night at unbelievable pressures under unbelievable amounts of tasks. I was doing the work of a small army or things that an army can't do because they were they were so complex. And I was living away in Philadelphia three nights a week, had my wife and kids here. Um, so my time with the family was precious to me and to them. And I would, you know, try to go to shul and a guy would, would start talking to me for five minutes. How are you? Good to see you. What's happening in life? And at the end of five minutes, then he would ask. He would ask, can I have so-and-so meet with you? So now, okay, did they, that five minutes that they wasted of my time, that's a precious five minutes that they stole because... I didn't ask them to come up to me. They came, they decided to come up to me. And they had, I have no reason to believe there was anything sincere about their interest in me. It was all about the ask. One of my, our top investors, very wise, Orthodox Jewish guy said to me, when, when someone contacts me and he wants to talk about multiple issues, the real issue is the last one. Everything else was just fluff. Mm. So yes, I started to not know which relationships I could trust or not trust. And I worked on multiple, by the way, I davened at home for a year. Mm. I couldn't go to a synagogue, to shul. That's hard. I was constantly interrupted, constantly stopped. I couldn't go to a store. I mean, once I went to a store, they blocked me in to my bank foreign to come talk with me in the parking lot. It was maddening. And I tried several techniques, like what I can do. If you, I'm not saying I did this, but if you, you know, you just tell people no, they don't take no for an answer because they're professional collectors. They're, that's what they do. If you would yell at them and slam the door at them, they don't mind. That's what they do. They have to get that all the time. So what I reasoned was their only motivation, their incentive is to come after me. There's no disincentive. What disincentive can there be? 
Finally, I came up with one and it worked. It took about three months to work and I hold by it very strictly. If anybody approaches me for money, or for anything, by the way, oh, we don't want your money, we want you to tour our school. Money. We don't want your money, we want you to be on the board of directors of the school. Money. We don't want your money, we want your advice on money. Okay. If anybody comes up to ask me for anything, except through a handwritten letter sent in the U.S. mail, they, they and the organization go on a one-year no charity list, one-year no tzedakah list. I actually keep that list. And if they do by email and I tell them that, I say, please don't send back to me, I'm sorry, or I didn't know, because that adds a second year to it. How many people are on the list right now? Or I don't know. We have this ongoing list, but it became, it w went way, 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 way down. It way down. People, the word got, got around. But the thing is, I have to hold to it. Right. If I'm going to start making exceptions, then I'm not holding to it. Um, so if someone wants advice, even the same, they would have to get <clears throat> a letter to right. you instead of coming over to you in the street and asking. So let me like, ask you. So brain. I was at a, a chasna, a wedding eh, a little while ago. Comes up to me. Oh, I wanted to talk to you about something. Okay. If you want to talk to me, why do you wait until you happen to see me at a wedding? You don't know if I was going to be there or not, or if I'd be there at the time that you were there or not, right? No, that's, not, that's not genuine. That's not authentic. Um, if it's a medical emergency, call 911. Everything else, they should be writing a letter. Now, I have some friends, and they communicate with me about, but they know never to ask me either directly or through trickery about money. I imagine you need help going through all the mail, right? It's not, it's a full I have an assistant. Job. I have an assistant, yes. Right. We'll be right back to this week's episode. A message from Kolel Chabad, the longest lasting charity in the world with an important message. Okay, let me ask you a question. What is better, giving $1,000 one time or giving $1 1,000 times? Again, you're giving the same amount of money, $1,000, but at one time, it's a big gift or many times, it's a small gift. And the Alta Rebbe, Reb Schneer Zalman, gives the answer in the late 1700s. You want to hear this answer? It's not what you think. The correct answer is giving $1 1,000 times. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons, but Rabbi Akiva teaches that every action goes according to how often it's done. And the Rambam explains, Maimonides says, that charity is not just about how much you give, but how many times you're engaged in the act of giving. Why? The key is sustained habits of generosity change a person's soul. So instead of giving once $1,000, you can change your soul a thousand times by giving $1 every time. Engaging in acts of giving transforms you. So you can help the people of Israel with a donation, but you can help yourself and the people of Israel with many donations. So instead of giving $1,800 like that, maybe split it up, okay? You can do ongoing donations, repetitive donations. Go to kolchabad.org slash kosher money. And instead of giving $180, click 18 and select how many times you want to give it. That ongoing, right? Maybe make it never-ending so that you get never-ending opportunities to give charity. And that's the key, automation. Whether it's giving to your 401k, whether it's putting money into your IRA, whether it's investing. If you can figure out a way, and Rich talks about this in the episode that we've had with him, if you can figure out a way to give without thinking, whether it's to yourself, to others, do that. Create a habit by not having to think about it. kolchabad.org slash kosher money. And now back to this week's episode. I do want to cover a couple of other things um, as, as we near the end. And I grew up many Shabbosim in your house, uh, in the basement. I know it well. <laughs> you were my karate uncle, right? He's an expert at martial arts. I used to run around yeshiva telling everyone I have an uncle who's a black belt. Whether or not that was true, I don't know, but like you were it. <laughs> and then you would come down after the Friday night meal. We would do some moves on each other. <laughs> um, you'd let us beat you up. But um, I've noticed in my 30s, right, as I look around the shul, more and more people are getting guns, permits. They're talking about it. And I think 
I don't want anything to do with a gun. If I had a gun, I'd probably shoot myself in the leg by mistake. But thinking back to my childhood with you, self-defense was important. Would you like to see more um, investment into self-defense that doesn't involve weapons or that's maybe not the first step, but people learn a little bit of karate, um, how to be careful, what to do, situational awareness, things of that nature before we run and you know take advantage of every gun permit and sale? There's a lot of components to your question, including one that's a, that's a life-threatening situation for a majority of people. First of all, I do not own a gun. I own guns, probably have, I don't even know how many. Two dozen, I don't know exactly. Guns are dangerous. They're very dangerous. They need to be locked up in safes. And I also own bear spray, which is tear gas, pepper spray, that'll shoot 25 or 30 feet. So I think people should own guns and keep them locked up in a safe and take safety courses on it. You must take lessons on it because especially with a semi-automatic, you eject the magazine, and you think it's empty, but there's one in the chamber. Unless you take that slide back and forth and it pops out. And even you, and you have to know never point the gun at anyone you're not willing to shoot. That's critical. And there are people, there are people that die because of mistakes with guns. They are dangerous. They're to be respected. I think every sane person should own one or more, including enough ammunition. And that's really in case there's a general breakdown in law and order. That's in case you get a foreign government hacking the electrical system and the grid is down for three months and then there's gangs roaming the streets. In terms of home defense, what I think most people who buy a gun don't realize is, when you pull out the gun, you better be ready to shoot that person and you may kill them. Are you ready to kill somebody? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually spoke to one of the chiefs of police in this area about a year ago about this point. He said, that is the key barrier. When someone pulls out the gun to shoot someone, can they actually do it? They have no practice training to do it. They're in a stressful situation. And that's why I think the bear spray, which is tear gas that will spray 25 or 30 feet, is much better. You're much more likely just to spray an intruder with bear spray than you are to shoot the gun. I mean, when you shoot a gun, by the way, it can go through a wall, hit somebody outside. I mean, bullets go right through walls, mm -hmm. I mean, unless you're talking about some you know, deep uh, stone wall. But they go right through walls. And you're going to be in a gunfight with somebody. Bullets could be firing upward, could be ricocheting. You really should be using, in my opinion, bear spray as the first line of defense. A gun is the second line of defense. Regarding martial arts. So, by the way, I, I have, I, ooh, what a move. Oh, very scary. <laughs> I love it. Every time I shake your hand, you you, you get me with that surprise uh, jab. <laughs> yeah, I have a black belt in Golden Fist martial arts. also have a black belt in mixed martial arts and a third degree brown belt in Ryukyu Kempo. And I still train. Who doesn't? Of course. And I still train uh, four to five days a week. I have a full karate gym in the basement. And I train with a guy who fought in the UFC seven times. And this is, you're in your 60s now, right? I'm 60, I'm turning 67 this uh, wow. this week, yes. And you're next, still next going week. strong. I do, I, I have a 150 pound bag downstairs. So 150 pounds is similar to what a person weighs. 120, 170, 180, and when I, punch or kick that back, I make it pop in the air. So I, I, run, I walk around around 220. So yeah, I can, I can generate the force, but also, you know, have the balance and the speed and the analysis of situations. And Most Orthodox whatever. Jews don't know this. They're not proficient, right? I, wouldn't you recommend two people? I mean, I, I think you would, but tell me, knowing the basics of self-defense without a weapon? Yes and no. There are self-defense courses that are given, like one course. Oh, you know, hit them this way. Oh, baloney. You know, you're going to get attacked by a guy who's much bigger and stronger. There might even be three of them and faster and who's experienced fighting in the street. Um, you have to be an experienced fighter to be able to really fight them. But the biggest danger, which is a danger to most people listening to this podcast, is um, obesity. Obesity is uh, killing the American public. I say killing, I mean literally with cancer, with heart disease, with stroke, with renal failure, with uh, depressed immune systems, um, with respiratory issues, it is killing the American public. And the way to beat that is stop eating sugar, stop eating carbs, and to exercise. So everyone should be exercising. Uh, I'm not your, your rabbi if you're an Orthodox Jew, but as far as I know, there's a chiv to, to take care of your health. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest Talmudic uh, Chachamim, uh, Torah scholars 
in the country, I know, um, works out almost every day on a treadmill. And he has his Gomorra open, and he's learning, but he's walking, walking, walking. And a Rabbi Nata Schiller from Orsa Mayak, he would swim two to three miles uh, four, five, four days a week. It is critical. So, and the way I got into martial arts originally was when I was 27 years old, I realized I need to, to do aerobic exercise for my health. Uh, I might as well learn a skill with it. Now I'm, I'm thrilled to have that skill. I mean, you know, no one knows happens in a fight, but I'm, I'm a walking gang, you know, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean, you know, someone insults me, fine, let them, let them go. I mean, don't fight unless I have to, but if I have to, I certainly can. But I also, it's for flexibility, for health, um, it's, it's very important. So if someone's in a dangerous situation, <laughs> three guys around them, you're saying the best bet is to run away, but you can't do that with a massive stomach you know, sitting, <laughs> sit, sitting, sitting right there in the belly, which, which does make sense. And I, I think there are a lot of mental health benefits to exercise as well that um, can help take uh, the stress off. Um, also, it's also prevention for Alzheimer's disease, dementia, other, other dementias, vascular dementias. It, it's just, um, by the way, and if you're, if there are three guys, no matter what your level of martial arts is, three guys threatening you, running is always the first defense. The mm. first defense is running. Someone's insulting you, and you have to yell back at them. No, sorry, sir. Uh, you're right. I apologize. And that's if you're talking about the the, the guys have their weak egos have to show off. Mm -hmm. You have a strong ego, strong sense of self. You can just walk away. Not fighting is the number one way. Just I'll tell you, a little martial arts. If there are three guys threatening you in karate movies, the guy will stand in the middle of the three guys and kick them. No, no, no. You pick the weakest looking guy. You lunge at him. Strike him in the eye. Can I say this? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. I mean, they love it. Okay, okay. I would. I would. I would. Uh, right. Gouge his eyes <laughs> and, and leopard paw him in the throat, <laughs> and then get around him, controlling his head, his head, his neck, back of his head and chin, and have his body between you and the other two guys. And then when you can make your getaway, you throw him at those guys and run that way. Almost act like a ventriloquist for a second and yeah, yes. Throw the dumb. Yeah, you don't stand between them. You can't right. run. Uh, you go for the, the weakest looking one, get in between you and, and you have to neutralize them first. They say that in EMS, as a first responder, if you're in a situation, you take your medic bag, your bag of equipment and put it in between you and the smart, the danger. So this way there's a separation. Very smart. Uh, you mentioned um, books, right? And most books have one or two points, which is why I love AI. I'll punch in <laughs> the title of the book and I say, just give me the top three things yeah. I can learn from the book. What are some books worth purchasing and reading every page cover to cover? Are there books that come to mind? It could be a Jewish book. It could be uh, a finance related book. Is there anything that, you know, you think back over the decades that that was a worthwhile investment for you? See, the world has changed. It's really changed. Like I said, using AI, instead of reading a 400 page book, you can get all the main points right there in, in three sentences. Uh, political books, which you know, kind of like some of these like podcasts, like a Tucker Carlson podcast, they just give you, or you know, MSNBC, they just give you one side. They have you captive and you really don't know if what they're saying is true or not true. If you see, find someone who knows what they're talking about, they could tell you all things that are not true about what's being said to you. So I'm not a big fan of reading books and letting them take control of you for four or 500 pages without getting the other point of view. The way the world has changed, like with YouTube, in YouTube, you can learn almost anything on YouTube. I don't care if you wanna know how to lay down a floor or fix your car or how to invest money or um, how to exercise or, or how to fix your computer or how to buy this or that. It just, it's all there and it's much more condensed than reading books. I've read a lot of books, but they've mostly been technical, scientific. You know, as a medical doctor, read an enormous amount of books, read, I mean, learned facts, 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 how to think through things, practice. And my, I have a doctorate in biophysics, so a tremendous amount of, of mathematics, physics, chemistry, biochemistry, biophysics uh, that I've, I've learned. So, and that obviously comes from books, and I don't even know if they use books anymore. Maybe it's all on tablets. But when you start to get out of that realm, you're putting your trust in the individual who's making that presentation to you. And it's, it's much more efficient to get the abridged version, get the points through, like I said, AI or a small video recap of it. Yeah, YouTube is tremendous. And like you've mentioned, you have 
a channel. So if, and I've seen you reply to comments, if anyone does want to check out uh, Dr. Rich's videos, highly recommend it. Get into the comment section. Um, there's some good debates going on sometimes. Um, so that's great. So I guess my last question is, uh, who wins the presidency in uh, 2024? <laughs> Do you have a prediction? What, what, where's your head on that? I've been asked to, you know, obviously I've been politically involved, you know, many steps along the way. I've had a number, a lot of United States senators, congressmen, governors, presidential candidates come here, right to this room. We've had luncheons for them or dinners, and I take them to the yeshiva, the big Orthodox Jewish school here, where they can see thousands of men learning and debating. So as of right now, it looks like Donald Trump. You know, in the 2016 campaign, I was the vice chairman of the Israel Advisory Committee for the Trump campaign. I wrote about half of the policies for the campaign. But let's be very clear. When he got elected, the uh, campaign was over. I was out. Like the, the, the Abraham Accords, I had nothing to do with, nothing at all, zero. And that's not, not me being modest. It's the truth. I was, the guys who did it, you know, Jared Kushner and, you know, and, and Friedman, and what they did is astounding. Did you want to be involved or you were okay? Um, I, I would have liked to have been the ambassador to Israel, but that was already kind of given to Friedman because it was Trump's lawyer for all those years. And the job that those guys did was fantastic. I was hinted at for other ambassadorships. I, I don't I don't need it. I don't want it. I worked my whole life so hard. Well, I'm supposed to be retired now. I, I have a lot going on for guys retired. I don't know why, but I seem to keep like, you know, think, doing things. Uh, but I want to say, so Trump was one of the most fantastic presidents we've ever had in terms of what he got done. He is his own worst enemy. If he could just keep his mouth shut, which he can't. I mean, like increases Adderall or whatever it is, you know, but he's his own worst enemy. I remember back in the 2016 campaign, he, I don't know, did something to insult Hispanics. How does he make up for it? He shows himself eating up, eating some tacos. It's like, oh, no. You ever just want to shoot him a text and say, no, no, please don't do that? Uh, he's not going to listen to me or anybody else. Um, he's going to do his own thing. But he is a loose cannon on deck with his mouth and with what he says and principles that he wants for the country are very sound, and his performance for the country is beyond dispute. Whether these legal things, what these legal things were, will or not do to him, I don't really know. You know, right now he's this moment he's faced with having to come up with four hundred and eighty million dollars of collateral. Is the how the courts are going to rule? Is in, is New York going to go in and? take all of his assets, what's that going to do to his run? I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. But in terms of you know how it looks, it looks like he'll be president. I do want to say there's, between now and the election, it's, it's November, we're now in March, I'm about, you know, about, about um, six months or so, seven months, eight months. That's an eternity in politics, an eternity in politics. You'll know much better about two months before the election. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that may change is the black community has voted up until now about 98% Democrat. And now, again, because of social media, you have more and more black people who are, who are realizing that the liberal policies have actually led to destruction for a lot of their own people. It's funny because a lot of black people are God-believing, church-going people whose values are actually Republican values, but they've always voted Democrat. And you now see um, there are some um, creases in that armor. And if you get 20% of the black community voting Republican, the Democrats are big time done, big time done. So we'll see. But it does look like it might be breaking that way. Wow. So much more to cover. I guess we'll have to do a round two. Okay. Maybe from the Oval Office. Hey, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much, uh, Uncle Dr. Rich. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Kosher Money. Kosher Money is produced with the help of our friends at Living Smarter Jewish. If you are in the need of financial resources, an advisor, someone to help you with debt, credit scores, anything to do with budgeting, you should look up livingsmarterjewish.org. If you just want to get straight to it, email them, info at livingsmarterjewish.org. They'll set up a 15-minute conversation, learn the ins and outs of your situation, and help you get on the path to financial calmness. I don't want to say freedom because I think there's 
a level of calmness that a lot of people have after they do an intro call and and start to understand um, a way out of whatever situation they're going through. And sometimes it's not a hard situation, but they just need clarity. So financial clarity, financial calmness. And guess what? It's free. So livingsmarterjewish.org. Thank you to our friends at Twillery. Remember that promo code is through March 29th. If you're listening to this after March 29th, 2024, use promo code Chai. Link is in the show notes. Get your free checkbooks. I know Perm has passed, but every Talish bag should have. You can do one, $2 denominations, five, 10, 18, 36. It goes up, I think, like all the way up to 1800 if you're a high roller. Go for it. Give charity. Give it the way God intended. I, I think that's a bit extreme, but give it the way God has blessed us in a way that, okay, you get the point. And thank you to our friends over at Kol Chabad. They are not the sponsor. We have a friend out in California who believes in Kol Chabad's mission so much. They're doing incredible things. Kolchabad.org slash kosher money. Sign up for their emails. It's kind of cool to see the updates of just about how much they're doing. It's not just food, it's clothing, it's shelter, it's resources, therapy. They're doing a lot and they are nimble. So they do a lot over, you know, the past two, three hundred years. But if God forbid something happens and it's instant, they're there in an instant. So Give money to a very good cause, and you can give it through the donors fund also. How cool is that? While you're wearing a Twillery shirt. Boom! We also accept donations at Living L'Chaim. A lot of what we do is funded by people just like you. So the link is in the show notes. The donorsfund.org. You can go there and actually donate to Living L'Chaim as well. So best of both worlds. And the charity goes to a good place. It helps us put more into the content, create more content, more podcasts, helps tell the world and the Jewish nation just what special just what's special about the Jewish nation which is kind of cool so help us tell the story thank you to everyone on behind the scenes Yoni Devora Sarah Yechiel Yaakov Michal Yehudis Eli that's me um there's more names Jody who Zoltron stop making up names bro Jody Srulli there's like 15 of us behind the scenes and they're an incredible team. So thank you for everything. If you want a tip of the week, here's my tip. When you are getting married or when you are making a simcha, it is very common for people to dance with you in the middle of the circle. And lots of times when they're dancing with you, the host is, the host of the party is dancing with you, he's already looking to see who he should dance with next. But it is very, very impactful when the person you're dancing with is being seen by you. Look at them, dance with them, dance in the moment, live in the moment. Everyone is rushing, 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 next, next. When am I gonna get the next promotion? When am I gonna get the next raise? When am I gonna be there? When am I gonna grow? When I... Just enjoy the moment on the back of the wagon of the best. Great song, I'll link to it in the show notes from the team at Thank You Hashem. We love them. I'm talking too much. We'll see you next time on Kosher Money. Bye-bye. Living L'Chaim.